What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. These are my full card breakdown and predictions for UFC Las Vegas. We got Piotr Jan going against Marab Davalishvili. And we are back breaking down another UFC card this week, breaking down UFC Las Vegas. We are not at the Apex this week, which is awesome. Uh, they're going to be at the theater at the Virgin Hotel, so it should be a, a good card. And yeah, I think the UFC did a great job because this card's fire. I mean, from top to bottom, a lot of great fights on this card. Um, the main event's great. Uh, Volkov, Romanov, co-main event. We got Krilov, Spans on the card we were supposed to watch a couple weeks ago. So yeah, another really good fight card. Um, you had a good card last week in UFC 285. We got UFC 286 next week, and we got UFC San Antonio to close out the month of March. So it's just a great time to be a fight fan. This month of March is going to be awesome. Uh, sorry, I am getting the video out a little bit late, as you guys may or may not know. I was at UFC 285 and was not able to get much done in Vegas. I was planning on maybe doing or trying to do some research, tape some of these fights, but there was no, <laughs> there was no way. Just a ton of going on in Vegas, um, but was able to come back. Um, needed to go into hibernation for about 12 hours to recover from Las Vegas, and then I was ready to uh, tape some fights, got everything done. So getting it out here on a Wednesday, a little bit later than I wanted to get it out, but getting it out nonetheless. Uh, but yeah, UFC 285 started out the month of March with a winning night. I had my biggest bet of the year on the the Shavkat Rachmanov, Jeff Neal, fight doesn't go to decision. I had a bet on it earlier in the week, and then I added on... And actually, uh, I added on again. So I had three and a half units total on the fight doesn't go to decision. I thought that bet was not cashing. And then all of a sudden, with like less than a minute left, Shavkat pulls a submission out of his hat, his ant, his big animal hat, and I was able to cash that fight doesn't go to decision. Um, and that made my night. So that was good. If that did not happen, it would have been a rough night. But was able to come out with a winning night about. Um, up about a unit and a half. So good way to start March there. And this is a card where I do have a ton of bets already. A lot of spots sticking out. A lot of plus money props sticking out. So can't wait to see how that plays out there. Uh, we did do the contest last week. Uh, we have the significant strike contest. And it was a tough one because John Jones went out there and finished Cyril Gaon in like two minutes. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people were not expecting that. But one guy was expecting that. And that was Derek 7642. Uh, he guessed 13 significant strikes. The correct answer was 11. So got really close there. Derek, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram with your PayPal or Cash App, and I will give you your winnings there. Um, next week, we'll do another contest for the UFC 286 card. Can't wait for that. Uh, now, still a great time to sign up on DFS by the numbers.com. Check out that $10 betting tier, which is the most popular tier. Um, with that, you get access to all my UFC stats you see on the Friday and Saturday shows. First notice on all bets, like I said, I have like 14. Um, this week. A lot of those are just plus money sprinkles, but still a lot of bets this week. Um, my full card uh, breakdown and best bet article, I'm working on that currently, should be out tonight at the very latest uh, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday afternoon. Uh, with that, I break down each and every fight, get my prediction, the round, the method, I give my best bet, and then at the end, I give all my best bets, my confidence ratings, lots of good stuff in there. Uh, access to Discord, my um, betting article that comes out on Friday, I break down all my tracked bets, and then I get my Hail Mary prelim and then main card parley as well so check out dfs by the numbers.com lots of stuff going on over there other than that you can follow me on twitter dfs underscore numbers instagram dfs by the numbers going live friday seven o'clock p.m eastern time for my final thoughts and then saturday once more going to be going live at one o'clock p.m eastern time two hours before the prelims for best bet Right now, I think we got uh, Narco Cop MMA, we got Danny Betts, and then we got uh, Johnny K Picks on there So for the Best Bet Show. So it should be a good panel there. But enough of all that. I say we get into it here. Um, like, subscribe. You guys killed it with the likes last week, by the way. We got like 700 likes, which um, I'm pretty sure that's a not only a record, but just you know, crushing the record on my channel. So appreciate you guys. Those likes do mean a ton. Helps me out a ton. So I appreciate all the likes. You guys I just smoked the like button last week. So... I say we get into it, though. We're going to start with the first fight of the card. We have Bruno Silva going against Tyson Nam. All right, so we'll start with Bruno Silva here, 32 years old, 5'4", with a 66-inch reach, 12-5, and 1-2-2-1. And, and one, and two, two, and um, I believe it's a no contest. 
Um, no, it was a draw. A 2-2-1 two, two, and one in his last five fights. As far as Tyson Nam, 39 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 68 inch reach, 21, 12 and 1 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. So, we'll take a look at the odds here like we always do and we see that Bruno Silva, he opened up as a plus 130 dog. And by the way, these lines this week, um just a ton of line movement all across the board. We have guys that opened up dogs, they're now massive favorites. We've had guys um, you know, open up slight favors. Now they're big favors. I mean, just crazy line movement on this card. And this is one of them where we have Silva opening up plus 130, currently plus 210. And then we have Tyson Nam opening up uh, minus 150, currently plus 180. So Tyson Nam, the guy is a 39-year-old flyweight, which you don't typically see guys, you know, around 40 years old, still competing at the lower divisions, especially flyweight. And Tyson Nam still going out there and still going out there and getting wins. He was able to knock out Odie Osborne in his last fight as a pretty big underdog in that fight. Um, Bruno Silva, we have not seen him in a while. Uh, the last time we saw Bruno Silva, I want to say was against that Victor Martinez guy from, uh, I think he fought in Alaska FC and he was able to go out there and, and finish him pretty quickly. But that was like two about two years ago, one year, eight months ago. And before that, he fought J.P. Bays and finished him. So we have not seen Bruno Silva in a while. Um, he's now 32 years old, of course, still much younger than than Tyson Nam. But the thing with Tyson Nam, and it's been his entire career, and it's it's why he probably has 12 losses. The, the reason Tyson Nam, I'm not a big fan of the guys because he's a, I don't know how to explain, like he's a flyweight that relies on on landing a big shot and knocking you out. He's somebody that goes out there and doesn't throw a ton of volume. He doesn't grapple at all. He's looking to go out there and, and put your lights out. And he's done that a lot in his career. He hits very hard, but at 39 years old at this point, it's really hard to favor him in a fight. Um, Bruno Silva, he's going to be the more active striker. Just you know, really got to mind your P's and Q's on the feet against Tyson Nam. And then more, um, more so, I, th I think he's going to have the grappling advantage here. Bruno Silva, good wrestler, very good grappler, black belt in BJJ. I think Silva does get the fight down to the mat. On paper, Tyson Nam does have a 100% takedown defense, but nobody's really tried to test that. I mean, you take a look at his fights here. He fought Zaruk Adeshev, the kickboxer. Jerome Rivera, who's not used to caliber. Uh, Matt Schnell, I don't believe, tried to take him down. Ode Osborne tried to strike with him. Kaikar France striker. Sergio Pettis. So, you know, nobody's really trying to take down Tyson Nam. So although on paper it's a 100% takedown defense, nobody's tested that. It's going to get tested here, and I think Silva does get this fight down to the mat. Mixing in the takedowns, um, being higher output on the feed, and ultimately coming away with the decision here. So give me Bruno Silva to win this fight by decision. I think he gets it done here on Saturday. All right. Moving on to this is probably uh, the toughest fight for me to call personally. It's not even the the closest line fight on the card, but it's a tough fight for me to call. We got Victor Henry, um, who is 35 years old, five foot seven with a 68 inch reach, 22 and six and three and two in his last five fights. Tony Gravely, 31 years old, five foot five with a 69 inch reach, uh, 23 and eight and three and two in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here. Like I said, we have. Um, Henry as the favorite, he opened up as a minus 150 favorite, currently minus 140. Tony Gravely as the underdog here, open up plus 130, currently plus 120. And I'm a big Tony Gravely fan. I like the guy a lot. I like his style. He's a guy that can go out there and wrestle you, wrestle you hard for 15 minutes. He does tend to slow down a little bit as the fight goes on. On the feet, not the best striker in the row, but he does have a ton of power. And Victor Henry is a guy that it's just... It seems like nobody can get a read on. I mean, he came into the UFC against Hayani Barcelos. And Barcelos was like a minus 500 favorite. Something crazy. And I'm still shocked to this day that Victor Henry was able to go out there as, as that big of a dog and put on that type of performance that nobody saw coming. He was able to pull off a big upset there against Hayani Barcelos. And then, fast forward a couple months later, he faces like a 40-year-old Rafael Asuncao, and he goes out there as a big favorite. He's like minus 350. And then he goes out there and loses to Rafael Asuncao, uh, where on the feet, he just did nothing. He literally did nothing on the feet. Like the entire first round did nothing. Um, it was actually Asuncao who doesn't throw anything in his own right that was outlanding Victor Henry. And then Asuncao was able to take down and control Victor Henry for that fight and, and win, and, win and, and beat him as a big dog. So it's hard to get a, a gauge on where Victor Henry's at. 
And initially, I was leaning Tony Gravely, but man, Victor Henry, his takedown defense is very good. His get-up game is incredible. He was able to stuff all the takedowns against Hany Barcelos. That was good. And even outside the UFC, he's getting taken down, but he's popping right back up. And I think that's going to be a problem for Tony Gravely, who, like I said, does tend to slow down as the fight goes on. Uh, Gravely's a really good wrestler. A wrestler, I think, will be able to get this fight down to the mat. Um... But I think he's going to struggle a little bit to do so. I think he's going to struggle to get these takedowns. And I really think he's going to struggle to hold down Victor Henry. So I feel like Victor Henry is going to be able to keep this on the feet for a good chunk of this fight. And when it's on the feet, you know, Tony Gravely is going to have the power advantage for sure. It's just Victor Henry is going to you know, bring the the volume, the the cardio, the pressure, the pace that I'm not sure Tony Gravely is going to be able to keep up with across three rounds. So extremely close fight. I think this fight can really go either way, but I do slightly lean with Victor Henry. The way I see it playing out is, you know, gravely going for takedowns, the majority of them getting stuffed. And if he does get those takedowns, I see Henry popping right back up. I think he's going to make gravely work, and I think he's going to put it on gravely as the fight goes on. So I'm going to say Henry wins a very close decision here, but I don't have a ton of confidence in this fight. But Henry, by decision for me. All right. Next, we got J.J. Aldrich going against Ariana Lipsky. We got J.J. Aldrich, 30 years old, 5'5", five five with a 67-inch reach, 11-5, and, and 3-2 and in her last five fights. Ariana Lipsky, 29 years old, 5'6", with a 67-inch reach, 14-8, and 2-3 and and in her last five fights. So, never thought I'd, I'd see the day. But we have J.J. Aldrich as one of the biggest favorites on the card. I believe she's the third biggest favorite. On the card, and it looks like she is, I think, the second biggest favorite, actually. Yeah, behind Mario Batista. So, yeah, JJ Aldrich opened at minus 145. She is currently minus 450. Ariana Lipsky opened up plus 125, currently plus 350. You know, first look, I'm like, why on earth is JJ Aldrich a minus 450 against anybody? Because she's not some world beater. She's not amazing anywhere you know her striking solid her you know wrestling solid her grappling is solid she's solid she's okay um and then I watched the tape and I and I, I see why JJ Aldridge is a big favorite here I just don't think Ariana Lipsky is UFC caliber uh, really at all on the feet Lipsky does have some power that's for sure. It's just she's so sloppy and wild on the feet. She's winging these big shots. I mean, J.J. Aldridge is going to be the much more technical striker, and it's it's not even close. I think J.J. Aldridge is going to have the better footwork here. She's going to be able to you know move away from those big looping shots of Lipsky. And then on top of that, first and foremost, like Lipsky has a huge hole in her game, and that holds the ground game. It's bad. It is very. It's actually hard to watch. Um, you know, Ariana Lipsky off her back. Her takedown defense is not good. And her ground game is atrocious. Um, you know, she's been finished on the mat several times. Montana De La Rosa got her out of there via ground and pound late second round. We saw Antonina Shevchenko get her out of there with ground and pound in the late second round as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, J.J. Aldrich wins this fight everywhere. On the feet, she should be the minute winner. Sure, Lipsky probably hits harder, has more power. But Aldrich should be able to uh, be the better striker on the feet. And then on top of that, like Aldrich... Should be able to take this fight down to the mat, no problem. And when Aldrich does get on top, I don't see Lipsky getting up. She can't. She literally can't get up. Like I said, it's hard to watch her ground game. It's like, it looks like she's never trained ever, to be honest. Like, I don't know. She's training at a good gym, too. Like, she's, I was checking her Instagram, and she's training with really good guys, really good fighters. It's just, she seems to be making no improvements in the grappling. It's it's not good. So, um, Aldrich should be able to get a takedown. And once she does get a takedown, Lipsky probably doesn't get back up. Um, so, yeah, I like Aldrich here. I think it's a tough matchup for Lipsky. Uh, I like Aldrich to have success in the striking, mix in the takedowns, win minutes on the on the feet, on the mat. And I'm going to say Aldrich eventually gets a TKO here late, late fight, uh, late third round. I'm going to say she gets on top and just beats up Lipsky across three rounds and, and gets that late finish. Decision's probably more likely, but I'm going to say he, she does give Lipsky like her fifth knockout loss yeah Lipsky's been knocked out four times it's not good but yeah give me Aldridge to win I'll take Aldridge to win late third round TKO all right next we have the biggest favorite on the card we got Mario Batista going against Guido Canetti we got Mario Batista who is 29 years old five foot nine with a 69 inch reach 11 and two and four and one in his last five fights Guido Canetti 43 years old five foot six with a 68 inch reach 10 and six and two and three in his last five fights 
So we'll take a look at the odds here. Like I said, Bartista, biggest favorite on the card. On some books, he's like minus 1,100. Some books, he's minus 1,000. Um, I can see a minus 950 here. I mean, he's a big favorite, opening up minus 350. So money's poured in on throughout the week, and and rightfully so. Uh, Guido Canetti, 43 years old at Bantamweight, which as far as I'm concerned, not only is he the oldest fighter in the Bantamweight division, but I believe he's the oldest fighter in the UFC. I know Andre Arlovsky is probably pretty close to him around there, but uh, we saw Alexia Linick retire, um, so he's not in the UFC anymore. Yeah, I, I think Guido Canetti is probably the, the oldest fighter in the UFC at Bantamweight, which is wild, and he's still winning. He went out there and, and finished um, Randy Costa. He went out there and finished Chris Montino, both in the first round. But this is going to be a, a pretty big step up in competition here against Mario Batista. Um, Mario Batista is looking very, very good. Uh, very, very good. Um, I think this guy is starting to find the groove here. He got knocked out by Trevin Jones a couple fights ago, but since then, like we're seeing a massive improvements in the game of Mario Batista. He's now 29 years old, um, in his prime. The wrestling looks really good. The grappling looks really good. I believe he's a brown belt on BJJ, and he's going out there and, and just starching guys lately. He went out there and, and starched Brian Kelleher. Got him out of there early with a submission. They went out there and, and finished that realtor and, and uh, Benito Lopez in the first round as well. And I think the same thing happens here. You know, Guido Canetti, the guy's been finished a ton in his career. Um, he's been finished four times by submission. That's a problem. He's also been knocked out. That's a problem. I think Mario Batista gets his fight down to the mat early and finishes the fight shortly after. Um, I just don't see where Kennedy has success outside of landing a big shot, which it, it may it, it could happen. I mean, it's not in, impossible that Guido Kennedy goes out there and, and knocks out Batista. Um, but 43 years old, it would just be it would be kind of shocking to me. But yeah, Batista has been knocked out before. Got knocked down by Sanhagen and uh, submitted. He got knocked out by Trevin Jones. So, I mean, the chin is in question. It's just, and Kennedy does hit hard. It's just Batista does have a clear path to victory. If he wants to, we can outstrike Kennedy, no problem. It's just take this fight down to the mat, take the path to least resistance. And I think he runs through Guido Kennedy if he does take that takedown route. So give me a Mario Batista here to win. Give me Mario Batista to win this fight by first round submission. And I think it makes pr it look pretty easy, you know, as the line does indicate. Uh, Kennedy does have power early on, but I think this fight hits the mat, and I think he runs right through Guido Kennedy. So give me Batista, first round, sub to get it done. All right. Um, moving on, we got SD Dumas going against Josh Fremd. We got Dumas, 27 years old, 6'2", with a 79-inch reach, 7-0, and 5-0 and in his last five fights. Josh Fremd. 29 years old, six foot four with a 76 and a half inch reach, nine and four, and two and three in his last five fights. So more kind of crazy line movement here. We got SD Dumas, who opened up as a very, very if I don't know if it's gonna load or not. Um, I don't know. It's not showing up. Anyway, he's minus 210 now. Uh, Josh Fremd is plus 180 now, but I remember like earlier in the week, like Dumas was like minus 130 or something like that. So money has been coming in on Dumas throughout the week. He's a very popular play. Like every time I logged into Twitter, I saw people placing bets on this guy, and I I get it. By the way, Dumas opened at minus 150. Best fight odds finally decided to load for me. So Dumas opened at minus 150. He's currently minus 210. All right. So anyway, uh, yeah, Dumas. This guy, I, I like the build of the guy. He's six foot two, pretty big, uh, pretty long, really rangy. He's gonna have a 79 inch reach, which is going to be a reach advantage in this matchup. And the thing with Dumas is his tape. He looks really good. Um, everywhere, like on the feet, he has solid leg kicks. I saw him land a nice head kick and knock somebody out cold. Um, very, very good power in his hands. Like some of these shots he's landing on these guys, it looks like they're barely landing, but he clearly has a ton of power in his hands. And what kind of impressed me the most about Dumas is I was listening to an interview on Pub Sports Radio um, uh, with Dumas, and Dumas was talking about how you know he he used to fight in like the church his church's chicken parking lot and all that and you know the good the dude's a fighter he wants to fight and then he started training and um he started talking about how his coach wanted him to train jujitsu and said it's very important in terms of MMA right and he was talking about how he hates jujitsu he doesn't want to do it um he wants to he wants to quit it and stuff and then um I thought that was funny that he doesn't like jujitsu or didn't at the time 
and because his, his grappling looks really good, and that was the most impressive part of his game to me is the, is the grappling. Um, he's able to get fights down to the mat, and when he gets fights down to the mat, he's able to get into dominant positions very quickly. I love his transitions, and then he's able to lock things up. You know, so he's very dangerous on the ground as well. So not only does he have a, a great build, six foot two, seventy nine inch reach, but he's dangerous on the feet, tons of power, and then he's very dangerous on the ground as well. So lots of reasons to like Dumas. It's just the one thing I don't like is the fact that he's just fought nobody. Um, you know, the level of competition is very poor, very questionable. Um, and this is going to probably be the toughest test to date. And that's, you know, it's it's an 0-2. Josh Fram who's 0-2 in the UFC, right? The losses to Treshawn Gore and um, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez. But in terms of picking a winner, I, I got to go Dumas here. Um, the line is, is getting a little wild for sure. There are some unknowns. And I'm not sure how good this guy actually is because he's not fought anybody. But... Um, I think I think he has potential to be a very solid fighter in the division. Josh Fram, I think he's solid as well. He's fought the better competition, obviously. Solid striker, solid grappler. Um, but you know, we did see uh, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez and the big difference between du Dumas and Fluffy Hernandez. But we did see Fluffy Hernandez take him down, put him into a, a ton of bad spots on the mat um, in his debut. We saw Treshawn Gore, you know, lock something up in the second round. Um, as well, we've seen Frem knocked out, uh, you know, before outside the UFC as well. So I think Dumas is going to have opportunities here to to not only win the fight but win it in pretty dominant fashion. Um, but I don't know. We're, maybe we, we get some questions answered here on Dumas. Maybe he does battle some adversity, but I'm going to say he does get the fight down to the mat eventually. And when he does, I think he's super dangerous there. I'm going to say he finds a submission in the first round. But yeah, it should be a very fun fight here. A fight I don't want anything to do with the betting perspective per se, but a fight as a fan I'm really looking forward to see because I think this fight's going to be one of the better fights on the prelim. So give me SD Dumas to win this fight and give me SD Dumas to win this fight by first round submission. All right, moving on, we got Davy Grant going against Rafael Asuncao. We got Davy Grant, 37 years old, five foot eight with a 69 inch reach, 12 and six and three and two in his last five fights. Rafael Asuncao, 40 years old, five foot five with a 66 and a half inch reach, 27 and nine, and one and four in his last five fights. So we will take a look at the odds here, and we see that Davy Grant is a slight favorite. Looks like some money's coming in on Rafael Asanta, but David Grant's currently sitting at minus. Um, my bad, I gotta fix this. So minus one thirty-five, and then Rafael Asanta is currently sitting at plus one fifty. So gonna fix that on the screen there. I could have sworn I fixed everything before the show, but it is what it is. Fixing it live. All right. Anyway. Um, yeah, this is an interesting fight here. You know, Davy Grant is a guy that is 37 years old, but I feel like he's kind of in his prime. Like, Davy Grant has never looked this good. Um, and at 36, 37, he's looking very impressive to me. Like, for for example, um, against Martin Day, this is where this whole run started off. Against Martin Day back in 2020, went out there and knocked out Martin Day in the third round. Solid win. Um Again, then it's Jonathan Martinez uh, went out there against Jonathan Martinez, gets dropped early, comes back in the second, knocks out Jonathan Martinez. Great win. A win that's aging very good. And then he goes out there against Marlon Vera, and, uh, and he went out there and won the first like round and a half against Marlon Vera. Lost to Marlon Vera, but there's no shame in that. And then he goes out there against Adrian Yanez and gives up a, a very competitive fight. Like that fight honestly could have went either way. It was a split decision. I was on Yanez in that fight. I didn't feel too comfortable going to decision with a Yanez ticket. But yeah, Davy Grant, I think his stock even went up in that in that Adrian Yanez fight. And then he goes out there and finishes Luis Smolk in the third round. So yeah, Davy Grant's been looking very good lately, whereas Rafael Asuntao has not. He's one and four in his last five fights, was able to pull off that big upset against Victor Henry, but prior to that got knocked out by Simone, knocked out by Garbrandt, and was submitted by Marlon Marias, uh, and then he lost the decision to Corey Sanhagen. So this is a matchup where I feel like it all comes down to how Davy Grant approaches this fight. Is Davy Grant going to go out there and fight Rafael Asuncao's fight? And that is going to be going out there and doing nothing. Rafael Asuncao is very good at kind of hypnotizing guys into doing nothing in there. And um, he has good counter striking, but and good wrestling as well. But he just doesn't throw anything at all. And how I think this is going to play out is Davy Grant is going to probably 
not respect Rafael Assuncao at all because David Grant strikes me as the guy to not go in there and respect anybody. Like, he went out there and threw down with Marlon Vera, went out there and threw down with Adrian Yanez. I think he'll have no problem going out there and, and throwing down with Rafael Assuncao, a 40-year-old Rafael Assuncao as well. So I think, you know, Davey Grant's just going to march this guy down, wing big looping shots, wild shots, and I think he puts Assuncao out here. We saw Assuncao, like I said, knocked out by Garbrandt recently. We saw him knocked out by Ricky Simone recently and I think Davy Grant's gonna catch him here so I like Davy Grant of course Rafael Sunsau does have a path to victory potentially with the wrestling you know taking down Davy Grant we have seen Davy Grant struggle on the mat in the past but I think his fight primarily does play out on the feet and when it does it's gonna be Davy Grant with a more volume and then b with a lot more finishing potential so I like Davy Grant here to win I like Davy Grant to win this fight I'll say second round knockout for Davy Grant in this one all right, moving on, we have Carl Williams going against Lucas Bresky. We got Carl Williams, 33 years old, six foot three with a 79 inch reach, seven and one, and four and one in his last five fights. Lucas Bresky, 30 years old, six foot four with a 78 and a half inch reach, eight and two, and two two and or two one and one and one no contest in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here. We see that Carl Williams money pouring in on the guy. He is currently sitting at minus 235 after opening up as a plus 145 underdog so not only did the line flip instantly but uh, money's been pouring in on Carl Williams Bresky he did open up as a favorite and now he's the underdog um, and he's sitting at plus 200 here so I like Carl Williams a lot in this spot Um, you know Bresky I just don't think he's that great and with that said he won his last fight against Marin Budai I'm not sure what the judges were really watching. Um, you know, Bresky went out there and almost like doubled up the strikes of Martin Budai across three rounds. So I think he won the last fight, but still, um, you know, I have some question marks about Bresky. He's a guy that, look, for example, look at his um, picture there on the screen, right? Completely jacked and in incredible shape. Um, and then he showed up to, to weigh-ins against uh, Martin Budai and he looks nothing like that anymore. And that's because he did pop for uh, perform- performance-enhancing drugs after the um, Contender Series fight, where he went out there and got a third-round submission. He popped, and that is why that is a no contest. And you can clearly see that he is no longer on any of those PEDs because he looks nothing like that in the picture. And, and Lucas Bresky, if you're listening to this, just change your picture on Sure Dog because you look you look nothing. You look nothing like you do anymore. So change change your picture, tapology shirt off, get all that fixed up because you look nothing like that no more. Um, but anyway, Carl Williams is a guy that has fought at light heavyweight. Both these guys are I feel like light heavyweights to me, but they're fighting at heavyweight, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, Carl Williams went out there on the contender series as a dog, as a pretty big dog as well. I remember taping that fight, um, the contender series fight with uh, Carl Williams. He was facing that that Penn State wrestler guy, Jimmy Lawson, right? And everybody was expecting the Penn State wrestler, Jimmy Lawson, to go out there and, and probably be the better wrestler, right? That was not the case at all. Uh, Carl Williams went out there and, and dominated Jimmy Lawson. It wasn't even close. Took him down from like 30 seconds in, 30 seconds to a minute. He takes him down and... It's wild to me that Carl Williams went out there and just he pitched he pitched a shutout. Um, Jimmy Lawson went out there and landed literally one significant strike in 15 minutes. One significant strike in 15 minutes. Carl Williams had like 11 minutes of control time, and that's kind of what Carl Williams does. He's gonna go out there, he's gonna take you down, and once he takes you down, you're not getting back up. And that's exactly what happened. Williams took him down in the first round, twice. He didn't get back up. Took him down in the second round. Did not get back up. And then took him, lost him down in the third round to not get back up. And that's kind of what I see happening here. Um, I like Lawson to, or I like uh, Carl Williams to take this guy down, Bresky. Get on top. And, you know, I don't think Bresky has the best cardio. Um, there's actually been fights where he's looking tired in like the first round. Like late first round, Bresky's getting tired. Like I said, he's no longer on those PEDs, on that juice no more. So, um, I think if Bresky wins this fight, it's probably um, 
like an early knockout or something, but Carl Williams is just not going to give him that opportunity. You know, Williams is going to get the fight down to the mat. He's going to get the fight he wants, and he's going to control this guy across three rounds. Uh, Carl Williams is not a finisher. He has really no finishing ability, but maybe Bresky completely gasses to the point where Williams just TKOs him or something, but I'm leaning Carl Williams here by decision. I think it's a good spot for him, and I think he gets it done here by decision against Lucas Bresky. All right, moving on. We got Victor or Vitor Petrino going against Anton Turcali. And we'll start with Petrino, who was 25 years old, six foot two with a 77 and a half inch reach, 7 and 0 and 5 and 0 in his last five fights. Anton Turcali, 26 years old, six foot four with a 78 inch reach, 8 and 1. And 4-1 and in his last five fights. We have a straight pick him here. Minus 110 each way uh, for Turcali and uh, Petrino. And just checking to see who opened up as the favorite. I believe it was uh, Petrino, yeah. Petrino opened up minus 170. Currently minus 110. And Turcali opened up around plus 150. And he's currently minus 110 here. So money is coming in on Turcali. And it's a close fight. Um, I think the the pick and price is, is pretty accurate. Because Petrino, on the feet, this guy can crack. This guy has a lot of power. Um, he can put guys out, no prob. And Turcali, on the feet, he has power in his own right as well. But he, he's very hittable. I think both these guys are hittable, though. So both these guys have power on the feet. Both these guys very hittable. And But yeah, Petrino has the power to potentially knock out Turcali. It's just the reason why... I would favor Turcali in this matchup is because I think he has more ways to win. I think Turcali could knock out Petrino on the feet. You know, we've seen Petrino hurt. Um, he got hurt on his contender series fight, dropped bad. Um, so I could see Turcali knocking out Petrino. But uh, the biggest path to victory I see here for Turcali is just the wrestling, the grappling. Um, he's a very good grappler, and it, it's weird. Um, before the contender series fight that Turcali had, where he went out there and went the full 15 minutes before that fight, um, he had not been over one and a half rounds. So I was like, not sure what this guy's cardio would look like after that one and a half round mark. But he answered those questions and answered them very well. He went out there and took down that Dos Santos guy in the contender series, took him down 11 times and controlled him for about 12 minutes of the fight. And it looked like he could have went like another two rounds. And which is funny because I believe he was, uh, after the fight, he was talking about how he thought it was a five-round fight. So he was preparing for five rounds. So yeah, his cardio is good. His wrestling is good. His grappling is good. When he gets on top, he's able to transition into dominant positions. Has really good ground and pound. Has a slick submission game as well. A couple subs on his record. And I think he's going to give Petrino problems here. Uh, Petrino, he has power. But really, that's about it. I mean, I don't like the gas tank of Petrino. You know, I've seen him taken down before. Turcali, as long as he doesn't get knocked out here, take this fight down to the mat, wear on Petrino. I think he finishes him uh, late in this matchup. So uh, I like Turcali here to win. I like him to win. I'll say second or third round submission for Anton Turcali. He's got to avoid those big shots early on. But yeah, wear on this dude. Get him tired to get him out of there. So give me Turcali to win. Give me Turcali to win this fight by, I'll say, second round submission. All right, moving on to the main card. We got Syed Nurmagomedov going against Jonathan Martinez. We got Syed Nurmagomedov, 30 years old, 5'8", with a 70-inch reach, 17-2, and 4-1 and and in his last five fights. Jonathan Martinez, 28 years old, 5'8", with a 69-and-a-half-inch reach, 17-4, uh, and 4-1 and four and one in his last five fights. So we'll take a look at the odds here and... Yeah, they're 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 wide. Um, Nurmagomedov opened up minus two twenty five, currently minus two fifty five. Jonathan Martinez opened up plus one ninety, currently plus two fifteen, and I'm not sure what's what's going on here, because I see this as a very, very very close fight. Like, um, are people expecting Nurmagomedov to go out there and, and wrestle just because his last name is Nurmagomedov? Like, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Because Nurmagomedov, that's not his game. I mean, Nurmagomedov thus far in the UFC has literally completed only two takedowns. And he's gotten, like, maybe a couple minutes of control off those two takedowns. Like, so I don't see him taking down Jonathan Martinez. Like, Nurmagomedov has a 9% takedown accuracy. He's not... He's not Khabib. Um, so, yeah, he took down Douglas Silva de Andrade once, but Andrade was able to pop right back up. Like, Nurmagomedov only got 22 seconds of control in that fight. So, 
if if he's not going to take down Jonathan Martinez, which I don't think he does. Maybe he tries, but I don't think he does take him down. And if this fight does stay standing, how on earth is Nurmagomedov, you know, minus 250 in this matchup? It doesn't make sense to me. Sure, you could you could favor him, but, um, you know, Martinez has been looking really good lately. Uh, had a really good fight in his last fight against Cub Swans, was able to finish him. He's been looking better than ever. Um, Martinez, he's 20 years old, another guy that's that's very young still, you know, in, in his prime or just about getting there. Uh, I like the volume of Martinez, the kicks of Martinez, and I think it's going to be a fight that goes to decision. I think it's close. I think it's competitive. And for that reason, I'm going to take the the pretty big dog here in Martinez. Like, sure, Nurmagomedov's probably more dangerous. If there was to be grappling upside in this matchup, it would come from him, but I don't really expect him to have success in that grappling. Um, so yeah, give me Martinez to pull off the upset. I think it's going to be a close fight, though. But these odds aren't indicating that this fight's going to be close at all. It's indicating that Nurmagomedov is going to go out there and and destroy this guy. I don't, I don't see that happening. So at the very least, I think it's a close fight. But I'll take the dog here and Jonathan Martinez to get it done. And I'll say like a split decision type fight. All right, a couple more fights here. We got Ricardo Ramos going against Austin Lingo. We got Ramos, 27 years old, five foot nine, with a 72 inch reach, 16 and four, and three and two in his last five fights. Austin Lingo, 28 years old, five foot ten, with a 70 inch reach, nine and one, and four and one in his last five fights. We see Ricardo Ramos is the favorite, and he opened up around minus 250. Austin Lingo opened up around plus 185, plus 190. And then just money's been coming in on Ramos. We see that Ramos is now minus 350, and then Lingo is now plus 285. So uh, what's interesting to me is the fact that Ramos is, is still only 27 years old, which is nice to see because he's been in the UFC for a while. Like, Ramos made his debut in the UFC back in 2017, like six years ago, a little over six years ago at this point. Um, so, yeah, he was, what, 22 years old when he made his debut, started the UFC runoff 3-0, Lost to Sayed Nurmagomedov, gets two more wins against Newsom and, and Garrett Gorey, loses to Lerone Murphy, and then loses to Zabara to Hugov. So yeah, uh, Ramos, I think he's solid. Uh, the, the thing is, I think this is a, a pretty big step down in competition for Ramos, going from guys like Lerone Murphy, you know, guys like Sayed Nurmagomedov, you know, Kung Ho Kong, um, I don't know, even like Danny Chavez is solid, and he, Bill Algio is a solid fighter, and then going to Austin Lingo, who I'm just not completely sold on like Austin Lingo outside the UFC I had some hope for the guy he's going out there and just starching guys in like the first minute of fights and doing that quite a bit it's just inside the UFC it's showing that you know, that knockout finishing ability it's just not translating um going out there and losing to uses allow is a huge red flag to me not only losing to uses allow but how he lost to, to, to allow in that matchup um we saw Zalao go out there and, and just dominate Austin Lingo in the grappling, which is not good. Zalao went out there and landed six takedowns against Lingo, was able to rack up over five minutes, over six minutes of control time, was able to um, almost submit him a couple times. I think there was like two pretty deep submissions. Lingo was able to fight out of those, but he's going against a different animal here in, in Ricardo Ramos. I think Ramos does have the wrestling to get the fight down to the mat. We saw Ramos go out there and land eight takedowns against Bill Algio. And obviously, he's a BJJ black belt as well. Multiple submissions in his career. I think uh, Ramos subs him here. I think Ramos submits Austin Lingo. I think he gets him down to the mat and, and finds a sub. And I think it's probably early as well. In terms of the striking, I even favor Ramos there. I really do. I think Ramos has more tools on the feet. Austin Lingo probably has the power. And Ramos is probably going to want to get this fight down to the mat. But even on the feet, I, I do favor Ramos. I think Ramos is, is better everywhere in this matchup, has more ways to win this matchup. I like Ramos to win this fight by sub, though. Um, but, yeah, for, for if, if Lingo was to pull off this upset, it probably is a knockout. But, like I said, that, that finishing ability is not translating to the UFC. Not being able to finish Jacob Kilburn is is concerning. Not being able to finish a gassed-out Luis Saldana is concerning. So I'm not sure he's going to be able to finish Ricardo Ramos, who Ramos has been finished before, but he, he got finished by Lerone Murphy. He got finished by Sander Magomedov with a spinning back kick. So, um, And I don't think you know uh, Lingo's on that level. So it's a big step down in competition for Ramos, and it's a big, big step up in competition for Austin Lingo. I like Ramos to get the fight down to the mat and win this fight by first-round submission. All right, moving on to a fight we talked about couple weeks ago, uh, we got Nikita Krilov going against Ryan Spann. We got Krilov, 30 years old, six foot three, 
with a 77 and a half inch reach, 29 and 9, 3 and 2 in his last five fights. Ryan Spann, 31 years old, 6 foot 5, they 81 and a half inch reach, 21 and 7 and 3 and 2 in his last five fights. So we have about the same odds as last time. Maybe a little bit less chalk on, on Krilov. So Krilov opened up minus 170. He's currently minus 165. Uh, Span opened up um, plus 145. He's currently plus 145. So, yeah, I could have sworn like Krilov was like minus 180, minus 190 the last time out. But Krilov actually was the one to pull out um, on fight day during the event. I think it was like early main card, something like that. Krilov pulled out due to like an illness or something, right? Um so that's interesting, and now they're fighting two weeks later, and now it's out of catch weight because both these guys had a lot of weight, especially Ryan Spann, you got to imagine, um, to get down to 205, so a catch weight definitely does make a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, I'm sticking with the same pick. Um, I think that the fact that Krilov was you know, ill or whatever, I, I don't think that matters a ton here, but um, sticking with the same pick here, and that pick was Ryan Spann. Um, it's a close fight, though. I mean, I think one of these guys gets served, and gets served pretty early. I really question the durability of both guys. Like, Krilov, I question the submission defense. He's been submitted a, like, a crazy concerning amount of times. I think it's like five or six times Nikita Krilov has been submitted, so that's a big concern for me. Um, it's been six times. And then Ryan Spann, I really question his durability. I don't think he has a great chin. Um, I think for he looks for a way out if the, if the fight gets tough. So... Yeah, I think somebody gets finished here. I think that's um, definitely in play here. But, yeah, for Ryan Spann, he has a ton of power on the feet, though. Both guys do. So I think Ryan Spann could be live for a knockout early. And then I also think Ryan Spann's really live for a submission, just due to the fact that Krilov, he's going to give Spann opportunities here, a lot of opportunities. Krilov is going to shoot him for takedowns. Um, you know, He leaves his neck out at times, and I can see Spann locking up a guillotine, and that's kind of what I'm predicting here. But... Like I said, I think somebody's getting finished, and probably in the first round, I think it's going to be an absolute car car crash, especially considering this fight is now three rounds, where it was supposed to be five rounds, so maybe in the five-round fight, um, either guy would have won to have, have paced themselves, but now that it's three rounds, I think they're going to go, they're going to go right away, like they typically do. Uh, Ryan Spann's not seen a second round in like six fights. Krilov goes out there and fights like a maniac from the jump, so I think it's going to be a fun fight that doesn't last too long, but I'm going to say Spann locks up, up, locks up a submission here. In the very first round, hard to be confident in picking a winner in this fight, but I'll take Span for the slight upset in this one. First round sub. All right. Co-main event, Alexander Romanov going against Alexander Volkov. We got Romanov, 32 years old, 6'2", with a 75-inch reach, 16-1, and 4-1 and one in his last five fights. Alexander Volkov, 34 years old, 6'7", with an 80-inch reach, 32-10, and 3-2 and and in his last five fights. We have Romanov opened up. I think he opened up about a pick -em. Or even like an underdog. Let me see. So he opened up, yeah, an underdog. Uh, plus 130, currently minus 150. Volkov opened up minus 150, and he is currently plus 130. So I'm a big Volkov fan. I like the guy. Um, I like the guy as a heavyweight. Like Volkov, he's, he's big, six foot seven, 80 inch reach. I think that's great. He's a guy that has really good volume for a heavyweight. I think that's great. And he's a guy that typically has really good cardio for a heavyweight. Um, but lately, I don't know. Like Volkov, just to me, he seems off. I don't want to say he's, he's declining or anything like that. He just seems off his last couple fights. Like, he's only 34 years old. With that said, though, he does have, like, 40-some fights. Maybe it is starting to catch up to him, but he just looks bad. Like, against Marcin Tybura, I had a very big bet on Alexander Volkov, and that was a lot closer than it really needed to be. Uh, Volkov looked tired in the first round, which was wild to me, like his mouth was wide open, he looked exhausted in the first round, and it was, it was the same thing against Aspinall, against Aspinall, there were a couple grappling exchanges early on, um, they get back up to the feet at, at one point, and Volkov just looks exhausted in, in the first rounds, so I'm not sure what's going on with Volkov, but he just doesn't look like himself to me as of late, with that said though, he went out there and starched, um, you know, Jerzyna Rosenstruck, but I don't know, um, the thing with Volkov, though, in, in this matchup, you know, Volkov, he has solid takedown defense, that's for sure, but his get-up game is just non-existent. When you take this guy down, he, he's typically not getting back up, and I think Romanov's going to get him down no problem. I think that, that's fair to say, especially early. I guess the, the one concern with Romanov is the cardio, and that it is a major concern in this matchup. Uh, Romanov does slow down as the fight goes on. We saw him slow down in the Espino fight. Not, had nothing left in the third round. 
We saw him slow down, even like in the Jared Vandera fight. Couldn't get him out on the first, went to the second. Um, looked very tired, was still able to finish Jared Vandera, but that's a concern. And then completely gassed out in the Marcin Tybura fight after the first round, after getting a 10-8. So yeah, the cardio is a major concern for Romanov. If he does not get you out of there early, I, I have my concerns. But I think he's going to have a lot of opportunities here against Volkov early on. I think he's absolutely going to be able to take down Volkov, no question. I, it's going to happen. Um, the, the question is, does he finish him early or not? And I think he's going to have opportunities to do so. You know, Alexander Romanov, great ground and pound, really good submission game for a heavyweight. I think he's going to have opportunities to find the sub or that TKO early on. If this fight does get to the second, I think he can even win the second here. And it's because I think one takedown, and that's probably the round, honestly. Like, Volkov, I don't think is a good get-up game. He's content to kind of lay on his back and lose minutes. And it's going to be hard for him to get up when there's a big, giant Alexander Romanov on top of you who's landing big shots. So... Um, even if Romanov does not stop Volkov in round one, which I, I think he will, I think he can still win the second round just by getting one takedown. So um, I do like Romanov here a, a decent amount. If Romanov had cardio for three rounds, I'd max bet him here. <laughs> but the, 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 um, he doesn't. He doesn't. So you can't be extremely confident either way. Um, but I think it's a really good matchup for him. Um, but yeah, I wish, wish they do had cardio make this make this pick so much easier, but I'm going to say he finishes Volkov in the first round, whether it's a TKO, whether it's a sub, I'll say sub first round, but even if it does go to the second round, I'm, I'm going to say he does get that takedown, win the second round, and then the third is going to get a little iffy, but I'm going to say Romanov gets it done regardless. I like him to win. I think he has more ways to win here. Um, I'm going to say Romanov first round sub here should be a very, very fun fight. Um, I've always been a Volkov guy, but I think it's a tough matchup for him here against somebody that's going to take him down and and beat him up on the mat and, and try to sub him, and I think it happens. So give me Romanov to win this fight, Romanov to win by first round sub. All right, main event. If you guys have not smashed the like button, be sure to smash. You guys killed it last week, but we have Piotr Jan, Rob Devalish, Philly. I did post a main event breakdown on this going into further detail. If you, not, if you have not checked that out, be sure to check it out on the channel. But um, I'm going to get my condensed version here. Piotr Jan, Rob Devalish, Philly. Great main event. Looking forward to this main event. Was looking forward to Rob Devalish, Philly fighting a five-round fight for a very long time. We're finally going to see it, and I, I can't wait for it. But yeah, we got Piotr Jan. 30 years old, 5'7", with a 67-inch reach, 16-4, and 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Marad Devalish Philly, 32 years old, 5'6", with a 68-inch reach, 15-4, and 5-0 and and oh in his last five fights. So, Piotr Jan, pretty big favorite. Um, and this line surprises me, not because I think it's wrong. Um, I actually think it's right. I think it's, per like, perfect here, minus 250. Um, but because I think people, well, I thought, people would be very, very low on Jan. And I thought people would be very, very high on Rob Devalish Philly at this point. So to see this line where it's at shocks me a little bit. I wish I would be able to get Jan at a better price, but that's not the case. Jan, minus 250, plus 210 on Rob. I see Jan, like, minus 280 on some books. So, yeah, I mean, Jan is, like, 1-3 in, in his last four fights, which is not good. Um, had that loss to Sterling, you know, via DQ. Had that loss to Sterling via like split decision, and then had that loss to O'Malley via split decision. Honestly, like he probably should have won that O'Malley fight. Uh, the Sterling fight, I get it, um, but I even scored the fight for Jan in that fight as well. And of course, that DQ, it was a fight where he was dominating on his way to dominating the fight and, and winning it, and then got that DQ there. So. Yes, he's one of three in his last five, last four fights, but I think there's some context there. Um, Rob's on a pretty big win streak. He's lost. He lost his first two UFC fights, and then has been on a nice little streak ever since. Um, I think this is a tough matchup for Rob. I know a lot of people are picking Rob this week, but I, I really, really like Piotr Jan like a lot in this matchup. I think it's a really good matchup for him. Um, Piotr Jan has incredible takedown defense. I, on paper, it's like 90%. But not only that, his, his take on defense is phenomenal, but his get-up game's phenomenal as well. And people are saying, which is a terrible argument, you know, Aljamain Sterling took down Piotr Jan and, and controlled him. You know, Marab Devalishvili should do the same thing. No, absolutely not. Um, two different types of grappling. Uh, Aljamain Sterling has much, much, much better control grappling than Marab. Marab has no control grappling at all. He cannot control anybody. For example, we saw against Gustavo Lopez, I think it was, 
Rob got 13 takedowns. That's because he cannot control anybody. He can take you down all day, all day, but he can't control you. So that Sterling fight means nothing to me in this matchup at all. Um, but yeah, Piotr Piotr Jan's takedown defense is great. His getup game is great. On the feet here at range, Murad Davalashvili is going to be at a massive disadvantage. A massive, massive disadvantage. For Murad to win this fight, he's going to have to stick to Piotr Jan like glue for 25 minutes straight. And I just struggle to see that happening. Um, Rob's going to get down Peter Jan, no doubt about it. He's going to take him down. He's going to take him down multiple times, probably. It's just, is he going to take him down like 20 times and across five rounds? And even if he does, you know, fights are based off of damage. Rob is going to do no damage to Peter Jan, whereas Peter Jan's going to be doing all the damage in this matchup. So, um, Rob's awesome. I love him just as much as everybody else, but this is a terrible matchup for him. I, I see why money's pouring in on Piotr Jan, and I wish I would have taped this fight a lot sooner to get a much better price on Jan, but minus 250 now seems about right. I think Piotr Jan wins this matchup, and I think he wins it inside the distance as well. Um, if Rob wins this fight, he's just going to have to, I don't know, It's gonna have to. he's going to have to push Jan against the cage, take him down, like 10 plus times across five rounds without getting hurt at all. Um, I don't know. I, I just don't see it personally. So I like Jan here. I like Jan a lot. I like Jan to finish this fight. I'm going to say fourth round TKO for Piotr Jan. I think he's going to really start to beat up Marab as the fight goes on. I think he's going to start stuffing those takedowns easier and easier. And once this is at range, I think he's going to put it on Marab. And I think he finishes him in the fourth round. Um, give me Piotr Jan fourth round knockout to get it done. Should be a very fun fight then. And like I said, I'm looking forward to seeing Rob fight a five-round fight. Because I think his style is really built for five rounds. But, man, it's a tough matchup against Peter Jan here. So, yeah, I think Peter Jan gets back on track. I think Rob takes an L. But I think Rob's going to be right back um, after this fight. And she should be fine. But, yeah, Peter Jan needs a win, though. He needs a win here. Because he has been losing fights he probably should be winning. But he's, he's losing. He needs to get a dub here. And I think he does. All right. We did it, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out. If you have not already, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. Check me out on Twitter, DFS underscore numbers. Instagram is DFS by the numbers. Check out the live stream Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Going live Saturday, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time for best bet. So make sure you turn on the post notification bell so you don't miss that miss out on that and then yeah check out dfs by the numbers uh, check out that ten dollar betting option um i have 14 bets for this card lots of um sprinkles i think like 11 of those bets are plus money i have a pretty big money line bet as well so yeah lots going on for this card and then of course we have two really good cards to end the month and ufc 286 next week and ufc san antonio thank you guys for watching best of luck for ufc las vegas and we'll talk to you guys soon see you later